A pneumatic starter or an air turbine starter is another way to describe it. I kind of like that because there's actually a, turb a turbine in the starter extracting energy. You're going to find this on all flying machines that instead of having a direct current or DC power system, they have an AC power system. And those four aircraft are going to be large turboprops, large business jets, large turbine helicopters, and transport category jets, airliners. All these aircraft, if you put an engine on it, remember these are really big, hence the term large. These are so big that the accessory section, you know, here's a person. There, the engine's really big. This starter motor right here might weigh 500 pounds. Oh, wait, what about the battery? The battery's going to weigh 500 pounds. And think about how big of a battery cable you're going to need. That thing could weigh 500 pounds. Oh, wait, and we've got two engines. So we could be looking at 2,000 pounds of starter motors, electric starter motors, and batteries, and battery cables. If, however, instead we had an APU in the tail of the airplane, and it only weighed 300 pounds, and we used ducting, and we used stainless steel ducting to run compressed air to the starter motor, but we made the starter motor smaller, and we made this a pneumatic starter, The weight of the APU and the stainless steel ducts and the, and the pneumatic starter might only be 500 pounds. And if we got two engines, we're going to have to add another one in, but we only have to have one APU. So we're going to have way less than 1,000 pounds versus more than 2,000 pounds. So we can save a lot of weight. So you're going to find on large turboprops, large business jets, large turbine helicopters, and transport category jets, you're going to find APUs. Typically on transport category jets, they put the APU back in the tail. That's why you see a little hole in the back there. That's where the exhaust is for the APU. And there's going to be stainless steel ducts feeding high uh, pressurized air at a huge volume, a huge volume uh, to uh, into the pneumatic system. And you can use it for air conditioning and pressurization, but you can use it to power pneumatic starters on large turboprops, large business jets, large turbine powered helicopters, and of course, transport category jets. Now, here I got a picture. Here is the picture of the cutaway of a pneumatic starter. You'll notice on the right here that there are turbine inlet guide vanes. Literally, these are stationary, and you'll notice as the air comes in and goes through here that this is a convergent duct, just like the stationary guide vanes. These are essentially turbine stators. Uh, can't spell turbine. Not, not essentially, they are turbine stators. So they increase the velocity way up. And look, here's the turbine blades. Here's our turbine bucket. So it's going to hit the turbine blade and bounce off. And this turbine wheel is going to rotate. It's going to rotate the shaft. We've got a gear reduction. And this shaft right here, here's the accessory section of the engine. And this power is going to go through the shaft, and here's the gear teeth. And that's going to go into the accessory section and up into the engine. Now, this gear reduction only works well while the turbine is at really high speed and the engine is only spinning so fast, say up to about 40%. What's going to have to happen after the engine gets up to 40% when we turn the pneumatic starter off, When we turn the pneumatic starter off, this shaft is going to get retracted back into the starter. And this is going to slow down this whole thing. 
is going to slow down to zero RPM. So the shaft with the teeth is going to slow down to zero RPM. Well, there's going to be that gear that it was hooked to with teeth, and it's still going to be spinning around. If the engine is running and inside the accessory section that gear, t gear with teeth is moving, and we try to re-engage the starter and push this back in, these teeth will all get busted off and they'll fall to the bottom of the accessory section and our magnetic chip detector will pick up the fact that there's a chip on it now we'll get a light in the cockpit saying we have metal in the bottom of our engine and we may have to shut the engine down and oh wait if all these teeth break off this starter motor won't be able to get the engine started anyway so what we're gonna have to do with pneumatic starters I'll get back to this other stuff here is that we once we disengage it once we turn the starter off and it slows down towards zero we cannot re-engage the starter until the engine comes back down to zero and the reason why is it's because the engine is still spinning and if we shove that gear back into the accessory section the teeth will break off and a the starter won't work and b we'll have pieces of metal sitting in the bottom of our engine and the magnetic tip detector will come on telling us that, that we just broke something so you, if you're on the ground and you let go of the starter switch and that gear retracts, if we're on the ground and we get up to 40%, get up to 20%, ignition on, fuel nozzles off, on, and we get up to 40% and we let go of the starter switch, if it's going higher than that and, we, and this gear has retracted out of the accessory section, if we have a hot start or a hung start, that number two step, you know, number one is fuel nozzles off, and number two is motor the engine if possible. That's This is where the if possible comes in. If we've already let go of the switch at 40%, this gear is retracted, and this is slowing down, We will n it will not be possible to do it, because if we do push the button and shove it back in, the teeth will all break off anyway, and it won't work. So, on transport category jets, big biz jets, big turboprops, big turbine-powered helicopters, since they have pneumatic starters on them, you cannot re-engage the starter motor if you've already let go of the starter switch. However, that number two, you know, number one, for case of a hot starter or hung start, start is fuel nozzles off, and number two is motor the engine if possible. This, if possible, if we have a hot start, let's say we're, we're coming up towards 40%, and just before we let go, we're looking at the EGT. We're looking at the EGT gauge, and it's coming up on the red line. If we're still holding the starter switch down, with the other hand, we're going to turn the fuel nozzles off, and we're going to hold. We're going. It is possible to motor the engine if we haven't let go of the starter switch yet. So if we haven't let go of the starter switch and we see a hot a hot start coming and we go ah, we don't want to freak out and let go of the starter switch. We want to hold it on down. We're going to turn off the fuel nozzles, and the engine will start decelerating some because we're not adding energy because of fuel burning. But more importantly, we're going to motor the engine because we want to blow cold air through it with the compressor. In case of a hot start or a hung start, spinning that compressor is the only thing that brings cold air into the engine. So if we can, we're going to motor the engine. If, a, if it's past 40% and we're running a pneumatic starter and we've already let go of the switch, we're going to be able to do step one. We won't be able to do step two. So this, if possible, is dependent upon whether we have a pneumatic starter or a or a DC starter generator and it's going to depend upon whether or not we've already let go of the switch or we're still holding down on the switch. Okay, this small turbine wheel is just geared down so this turbine wheel spins really really fast and it's geared down to spin the engine. This pressurized air it's it's at about 60 psi it's not that high of a pressure but it's an amazingly huge volume if you were a firefighter and you went out to uh, this is a pretty lousy fire hydrant and you ran a uh, three inch diameter hose water hose off of it and hooked it up to a nozzle I don't 
okay, I'm going to stop drawing this fire hose. This person here holding on to it, it takes quite a, let's see. Oh, let's see, do I have, I guess there's two legs, two legs, two arms. That's pretty good. Oh, I need a fire hat, sorry. Hey, red fire hat. Oh, if we have a three inch diameter fire hose, the water pressure in here, household water pressure, is only 40 to 60 PSI, but sometimes you need a second person to handle this hose because there's so much power going on. Same thing going to this uh, turbine wheel inside of the pneumatic starter. Although the air pressure is only about 60 PSI, it is a huge volume, just like the water in uh, a fire hydrant three-inch diameter hose is a huge volume so you can get you do get a huge amount of horsepower you can get this 60 psi air at an amazingly huge volume from three places you can fire up the auxiliary power unit on the airplane turn on the APU and it'll supply pressurized air or you could hook it up to a ground power unit a ground cart and it has a jet engine spinning around providing air or if you get one of the engines running one of the main engines on the airplane running it can supply bleed, bleed air off of the compressor into the pneumatic system and use that to start all the other engines Turbines are really good at extracting energy. So the weight compared to how much horsepower it can provide to the engine, the weight compared to a DC starter generator is much, much less. If you add in the weight of the pneumatic starter, the weight of the stainless steel ducting to run the air from the APU and add in the APU on big whole honking aircraft, the weight of the starter and the APU and the, and the pneumatic ducts is far less than if you had huge giant DC generators and huge batteries. And of course we already covered why you can't re-engage pneumatic starters if you've let go of the starter switch. Now pneumatic starters since uh, it's just hot air blowing across a turbine wheel and the turbine wheel is designed to withstand high temperatures they generally don't have a duty cycle. You can run them for a long, long time. Or some of them have a long duty cycle and it'll say five minutes, which compared to 20 or 30 seconds on for a DC starter generator, that's a huge difference. DC starter generators get hot whenever you're uh, sending electrical power through them because whenever amps, whenever electricity goes through a wire, the wire gets hotter because some of the energy is used up in the starter in the, and is turned into heat. And so if you run DC starter generators too long, they'll get too hot, wire insulation will melt, you'll burn up the starter motor. Uh, pneumatic starters, since they're not using electricity and we don't have wires and insulation, that's not an issue because the turbine inside of the pneumatic starter is made just like a turbine blade inside of a jet engine and it's designed to withstand high temperatures. So you'll find pneumatic starters either don't have a duty cycle listed or it's very, very long, like five minutes. Now this slide right here is uh, some obscure starters. These are essentially found on military aircraft, so I'm not going to ask you about it on the test. A cartridge starter is essentially a pneumatic starter, but instead of getting power from another engine via compressed air, it has a gunpowder cartridge. This is actually about the size of a big coffee can, and it burns slowly. You flip a switch in the cockpit, and it, it, there's a spark catches it on fire, it burns. Now this has a turbine wheel, but you'll notice this has a radial inflow turbine. So air is going to have to radially inflow and go out. And so this turbine wheel is going to extract energy, run it into a bunch of gears, and then this main gear goes into the accessory section. So really, this part right here is just a pneumatic starter. The only whoops, the only difference between a pneumatic starter and a cartridge starter is the source of the air. Now the nice thing about this is that you can jump into the airplane and turn this on like in a B-52 or in another airplane that has new, that sits on alert and you want to be able to start the engines really fast. You can start the engines really fast and you can start them all at once. You don't have to get one engine started and then another and then another and then another. You can start a bunch of engines simultaneously and you don't have to run an APU or a ground power unit.
One of my personal favorites uh, is on an F-16 is a jet fuel starter is another name for it, or a GATS. Literally, the starter motor is a small turboshaft engine. It's really wild. I am not making this up. There's a really small DC motor that runs off of a battery, and it spins around through a shaft, this main shaft. Here's a compressor. The air comes in. Here's our impeller. Here's our diffuser. Here's a fuel nozzle. Here's our annular combustion chamber. Here's our stationary guide vanes. Here's our rotating turbine blades. It spins this around, and this provides energy to drive the compressor. And then there's no mechanical connection in here, but the air keeps blowing across another set of stationary blades, stationary turbine blades. And then these turbine blades here, they rotate. They're geared down to spin it slower, and this shaft goes into the accessory section of the engine. So literally, you use a small DC motor, to spin up essentially a turbo shaft engine and this turbo shaft engine spins up the engine now on an F16 on an F16 however although it uses a jet fuel starter on an F16 it uses a hydraulic motor to get the jet fuel starter running there's also hydraulic systems just like I talked about there. You can actually use an accumulator. You've got compressed gas on one side and a diaphragm, and then you've got hydraulic fluid at a high pressure, and the starter motor to run to run the APU. Like, for instance, if you're flying a CH-47, CH-46, then you're going to use a hydraulic starter motor that is powered off of an accumulator to get the APU running. Then the APU provides power to start the main engines in the form of pneumatic power, but the APU gets started off a hydraulic starter motor, and the hydraulic starter motor gets operated off of an accumulator. The nice thing about this is you don't have to worry about battery. If the accumulator depletes, there's a hand pump that you can pump it by hand to recharge this. Um, but I've, on, I've only seen these on military aircraft. Then there's the last one, an air impingement starter, if you're uh, flying a T-38, it has a General Electric J-85, and your name is Matt, then uh, that is one of the very few engines that doesn't actually have a starter motor on it. Literally, you take compressed air off of a ground power unit, and you run it through the turbine section. You actually pump it through the turbine section, and that gets the engine spinning. There's actually no starter motor on the engine at all. There might be another one or two engines out there somewhere that do this, but as far as I know, Matt, uh, a J85 is one of the few engines that has an air impingement starter, and you know, it can only start it off a of ground power unit because a T38, Matt, doesn't have an APU on board the airplane. auxiliary power units. Here's some pictures, I love that guy's hairdo, of some APUs. Uh, they're typically small turboshaft engines and on transport category jets they typically mount them in the tail. Same thing on large biz jets and large turboprops. They typically put them in the tail of the airplane. You're going to find APUs or auxiliary power units on any aircraft that has alternating current that is, instead of direct current, alternating current electrical systems. This is typically transport category jets, large business jets, large turboprops, and large turbine-powered helicopters. That's in contrast to DC starter generators, which you will find on small turbine helicopters, small turboprops, and small business jets. Um, even though these are going to commonly have generators on them that produce alternating current and they're installed on airplanes that mostly have alternating current systems and components. The APU is going to be started up by use of a battery. A battery only produces direct current so you need a DC motor, a DC starter motor that runs off of this direct current. Almost always it's 28 volts. Um, one thing that's unusual about APUs compared to the flight engine, the, the propulsion engine, the engine that propels the aircraft, is that APU starting sequences are typically extremely automatic. Even on older aircraft, the APU, you'll flip one or two switches, turn the master on, grab the, 
run switch and push it up to start and as soon as it starts spinning you let go of it and the APU takes care of the rest of it um, which is different than most flight engines where you have to do some of the starting steps there's going to be some kind of a governor just like a propeller governor on a constant speed prop driven airplane like on a Seminole controlling engine RPM there's going to be a governor on an APU and that RPM on an APU it's going to run at 100% all the time. Idle is 100%, full power is 100%. If you turn things on and take power off of the APU, it'll just give it more fuel, so it'll maintain 100%. APUs typically provide two things, pressurized air at a really high volume and electrical power. There's two ways to provide this pressurized high volume air. Oops. An APU is just a turbo shaft engine. So of course you know how to draw a stick diagram of a turbo shaft engine. Of course we need an extra turbine or two to drive the gear reduction unit so we can have power at the output shaft you can get pressurized air off of an APU one of two ways. You can either use the output shaft to drive a centrifugal compressor, it's almost always a centrifugal compressor, and there's the high volume pressurized gases. Or you can design the APU uh, from scratch that it's going to be an APU and you can put a few extra compressor blades inside of the engine and you can bleed some air off of the compressor because the compressor is too big. Either way you're going to get a very high volume of air and you can get it at a pressure. Usually this pressure goes into the pneumatic system of the airplane at about 60 pounds per square inch. So, you can either take bleed air off of a compressor if the APU has a really extra big compressor, or the output shaft on this turbo shaft engine can run a centrifugal compressor. Here is, uh, if you look at the tire oprop in the classroom, it's a TPE 331, but it was when it was originally designed, it was designed as an APU. It has a compressor that has two stages of centrifugal compression, and then it looks like it's got one, two, three stages of turbines and the output shaft instead of going to a gear reduction box for a propeller there is another, it's hard to see it in here, but there's a centrifugal compressor and it's going to pull air in and provide a lot of high volume pressurized air for the pneumatic system in a transport category jet and you can also see the shaft keeps coming and there's some gears and they've cut it away, but there's going to be a really nice spot down here to hook up an alternating current generator. So that TPE331, that tire oprop, was originally designed as an APU with the output shaft to run its own centrifugal compressor to provide bleed air or compressed air for the pneumatic system. Wow, let's see if I can stay in the lines. and hey it's almost as if I knew what I was talking about and the second thing that it's going to provide is uh, alternating current electricity by driving an alternating current generator you can see on this picture of an APU very clearly there's a spot to bolt something on and sure enough that's what would get bolted on here would be an alternating current generator now alternating current generators have to put out 400 Hertz that is the frequency of this alternating current you don't have to write this down but the sine wave you got to have 400 of these per second and on a typical airplane engine that's propelling the engine if you bolt it straight to the engine the engines gonna vary RPM and it's the RPM of the generator that puts out what frequency it is but since APUs 
run at 100% RPM all the time, we can just bolt the generator smack onto the engine because the engine isn't going to change RPMs and we don't have to have what's called a constant speed drive to spin it around. All we need is for the APU itself to maintain a constant RPM. It looks to me like this right here is our DC starter motor and of course this whole thing right here is the uh, accessory section and you can bolt lots of stuff onto it and of course there's going to have to be some kind of gear reduction in here because that AC generator is probably only going to run at about 6,000 RPMs yet APUs, they're really small jet engines they could be doing anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000 RPMs for the APU engine and this is the burner can, this is actually the fuel nozzle and this is probably the igniter coming in on the side yep uh, if you look on a Boeing 727 whoops, Boeing 727 I think it's on another here we go we'll get, come back to that in a moment here all right, a Boeing 727, they came out in the early 1960s, and it was just, the APU was just a turbojet with an extra big compressor, and all you did was bleed air off of it so you could run the pneumatic system. That pneumatic system, you can, on the ground, run the air conditioning to heat or cool the cabin so it's comfortable, and, of course, to start the main engines, to run the pneumatic starter motors on the main engines, you could use this bleed air in the pneumatic system to power the pneumatic starters and of course there are also some ground power units that uh, you can hook up to the airplane it's just a turbojet and you just take bleed air off of the engine to run to start to either run the air conditioning or and or to start the engines and that was a picture of a GPU so that's a 727 it just was a turbojet and you took bleed air off it so you had pneumatic power but it's really nice to have this pneumatic power to run the air conditioning on the ground to heat or cool the airplane and the electrical power is so you can run lights and you can run avionics and you can run the blender in first class you ever notice when you get onto an airplane and you're walking back to coach everybody in first class already has a margarita in their hand it's because the APU is driving that AC electrical generator and it's providing power to the galley so they can run the blender so people in first class can have a margarita when the main engines aren't running so you can have uh, yeah at least that's that's what i think they do okay and of course i guess this is a little bit redundant apus they, those are the ones on the airplane auxiliary power units drive two things one would be an air compressor and of course whether it's a separate compressor or you're taking bleed air off of the main compressor it's still an air compressor and two you're going to run an alternating current generator and of course that's where you get the power for engine start is from the compressor or bleed, you can bleed air off of the APU to run the pneumatic powers a ground power unit, a ground power unit is the same thing as an auxiliary power unit except a ground power unit is in a cart like this. Here's uh, there's actually a jet engine in there. This is the hose right there, and that's uh, supplies the bleed air. That hose is about three inches in diameter, and you can hook it up to the side of the airplane and plug it into the pneumatic system, and run the air conditioner on the ground. And you can start the main engines using the pneumatic starters, just like if it was an APU. And there's also some ground power units that provide electrical power as well, just like uh, a modern APU does. And of course, I already covered that part. If you have any questions about starting, you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to make this lecture better, get a hold of me as well. Thank you. This is the chapter on engine operation, part one. First, flight planning issues. Uh, you got to know how much fuel you're going to burn. Uh, if you're running the engine, obviously to taxi out to the runway, that's going to burn some fuel. And if you're running the APU, that's going to burn some fuel. You also need to take into account how much fuel was on the aircraft when you started, got out to the aircraft, that is, and how much fuel did the APU burn 
while you were on the ground going nowhere. If you're used to flying a reciprocating, a piston-powered engine aircraft, then you don't typically have APU, so you don't have to take that into account. But now you're going to need to take that into account. Takeoff performance. If you have an aircraft and you're operating it under FAR Part 91, and it doesn't matter whether it's a recip or a jet, and your acceleration distance and to just before you would uh, rotate and lift off, this is this spot right here, it's called V1 or decision speed. If you abort the takeoff, pull all the engines back to idle, slam on the brakes. Under part 91, it's okay if the uh, total distance to accelerate, get up to your decision speed just before you rotate, abort the takeoff, pull all the throttles to idle, slam on the brakes, and then decelerate. If that total distance is greater than the length of the asphalt you've got. Under part 91, that's okay. You might say it's not a great idea, but it's okay to do that. So if you're in a Cessna 172 and it takes 900 feet to get off the ground and you all, and it takes uh, 400 feet to decelerate and your asphalt is, let's see, 900 and 300, and your asphalt is only 1,200 feet then you'd end up 100 feet off of the end of the runway. And under Part 91, that's okay. In fact, if you're a Part 91 business jet, or if your company buys a 737 to haul the vice presidents around, you can do that under Part 91. It's typically not done under Part 91, but you could. However, under FAR Part 121 and 135, you don't get to do that. You have to check and see if your acceleration and deceleration distance fit within the available runway or the available asphalt. If the answer is no, then under 121 and 135 you cannot go. You cannot attempt the takeoff if you calculate that your acceleration up to V1, which is decision speed, which is typically just before you rotate. If your acceleration distance plus your deceleration distance is farther, a greater amount than you have asphalt, then you cannot attempt a takeoff under 121 or 135. Now you also have to remember that this deceleration distance is taking into account that yes, you'll use your anti-skid brakes in your calculations but no thrust reversers oops can't spell thrust thrust reversers or uh, uh, pitch reverse if you if you have a turboprop because if one engine quits and you go to thrust reverse or reverse pitch it'll tend to yaw you too much so for calculations purposes for calculating for calculating takeoff performance under 121 or 135 to see how much runway you need, you'll need to take into account your acceleration distance plus your deceleration distance. It has to fall within the available asphalt, and you're cal going to calculate it as if you're on a planning on using your anti-skid brakes. But you're going to plan that you're not going to use reverse thrust, or you're not going to, and you're not going to reuse reverse pitch if you have propellers. Balanced field length. The balanced field length is essentially saying that. You can accelerate up to V1 and decelerate, and that length right there, that's your balanced field length. So that's a particular distance. Of course, on uh, transport category jets, big biz jets, big turboprops, if you've got this 7,000 foot long runway for uh, Boeing 727, that's a short field takeoff and landing. And in fact, if you've got a big business jet, say a Grumman Gulfstream 5 or a Citation 10, it's a short field takeoff and landing. So essentially, when you start flying big business jets, big turboprops, and big transport ca and transport category jets, pretty much you're always going to be doing a short field takeoff and landing. So you're going to use some flaps.
on takeoff all the time. You're always going to be using takeoff flaps because you're always going to be doing a short field takeoff. Of course, if you're going to run into icing conditions, you're going to have to turn on your anti-icing systems, and it takes fuel. That is, the anti-icing systems are going to require you to burn more fuel than you would otherwise. We'll get into it in another chapter, but if you have a transport category jet, big biz jet, big turboprop, and you take bleed air off of the engines, you're going to run some of that bleed air across the leading edges of the wings and across the leading edges of the vertical and horizontal stabilizers and taking that bleed air off of the engine is uh, means that the engine is going to have to work harder. You're actually going to have to burn fuel to provide this compressed air, this compressed hot air to pump it into the pneumatic system. So if you know you're going to go into icing conditions, whether it's forecast or whether it's known whoops, whether it's known icing, then you have to add extra fuel. You cannot use your reserve to do this. That is, you cannot plan. You can't plan on using your reserve. The reserve is there for things you don't plan on. So if you know if you're going to fly through icing conditions, you'll have to figure out how much extra fuel you're going to burn, and you'll have to put that on board the airplane because you cannot use your fuel reserve for that. Now, obviously, after you take off, you can use your fuel reserve for whatever you want, but whether it's forecast icing or known icing, you'll know about this in advance, and so you'll be able to put more fuel on board the airplane. Of course, if you're going to fly through turbulence, you may decide that you want to fly around it, and of course you'd have to put more fuel on board for that. Same thing for air traffic control delays. If you're going to have to hold somewhere, you're going to have to put more fuel on the airplane. And then landing performance. Interestingly enough, for 121 and 135 jets and uh, turboprops, when you come in and land and you decelerate this distance right here, this is based on no thrust reversers again, but yes, anti-skid brakes. This is for planning purposes. For planning landing. If you're planning a landing, you have to figure out how long it'll take you to stop if you do have the anti-skid working, but no reverse thrust and no reverse pitch. And this distance right here, right here, this distance right here, this can only be 60% of the total runway. So if your runway was short like this, let's just say this distance here to slow down was 3,000 feet to decelerate based on using your anti-skid but not using your reverse thrust and not using a reverse pitch, you would need another uh, chunk of runway it would be 1,500 feet long, so that 40% of your runway is remaining. That is, you have to plan on being able to touch down and stop during the first 60% of the available asphalt, and that's under 121 and 135. Okay, you're going to go out to your airplane. You're going to have to make sure that it's in safe condition for flight. If you look under the first few parts of FAR Part 91, it says the pilot in command is responsible for determining if the aircraft is in safe in a safe condition for flight. It also says no one may operate an aircraft in an unairworthy condition. Almost all turbine-powered aircraft have a minimum equipment list. MEL in this case is not multi-engine land. It's minimum equipment list. Yeah. The uh, minimum equipment list is going to tell you if something's broken, what you can do uh, about flying that day. If it's something minor, it'll say you can go fly. If it's something major, it may say that you have to do something about it. It may say that a mechanic has to do something about it. And it'll tell you the conditions under which you can go. You can go at night, you can go in day, you can go IFR, you can go VFR. Um, so. That works out pretty good for jet engines. We're going to talk more about that when we get to the chapter on airworthiness requirements. Life-limited components. Life-limited components are a component that when it hits its life limit, 
you cannot do anything to make it airworthy again. You have to throw it away or melt it or recycle it. Uh, typical life limited components for jet engines are the turbine blades, the stationary in particular, in particular the rotating blades. They're getting stressed more than any other part on the engine. They're subject to centrifugal forces. They're subject to really high temperatures. You're blowing gases across it at a really high speed. So you tend to, da uh, the wear, not wear out as in reduce metal, but you tend to, um, stress those parts over and over and over again and at some point they're going to fail they're going to break so before they break they'll hit their life limit so just say you tested a jet engine and you found that every 10,000 engine starts the turbine blades started cracking so you just say well you know what I'm going to multiply that pint times seven and I'm going to say 7,000 engine starts is the life limit on those turbine blades and so now when the turbine blades get to 7,000 engine starts, you have to take them out of the, take the engine apart, take those blades out, you can melt them down or throw them away or, or uh, scrap them. But there's nothing you can do, a life limited component, there is nothing you can do to turn that part back into an airworthy part. You can't inspect it, you can't fix it, you can't repair it. There's nothing you can do to get it to be airworthy again. And the pilot in command the pilot in command is responsible for making sure that you don't fly the airplane and have a life limited component reach its life limit and be flying with a life limited component that's that's expired that is the pilot in command's responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen of course if there's ice on the aircraft you're going to need to de-ice it did you know in part 91 it says no person shall take off an aircraft with ice or frost on the wings at all none none so You'll need to be familiar with ground de-icing, especially if you're flying for the airlines. You don't want to just go, oh, no, there's ice on the plane. We can't go. It's like, okay, let's get out the ground de-icing equipment and de-ice this puppy because we're going to go because we're a scheduled airline and we got to make money and sell tickets. Um, in a jet engine, let's say we have the oil reservoir on the side of the engine. And inside of the engine, we're going to be pumping scavenge pumps on the accessory section. Scavenge pumps are going to be pumping oil out of the engine and pumping it to the reservoir. And let's say here's here's full. And of course there's a dipstick in here. What might happen after the engine has been sitting for a long time, although there's a one-way valve, a check valve, it's possible that some of this oil, some of this engine oil, might seat back towards the middle of the engine and the fuel level, or correction, the oil level, will go down. If you pull the dipstick out, and here's the full mark, the oil level might be lower than the full mark. So if you filled it back up, if you filled the oil back up to the full mark and then started the engine, this oil inside the engine is going to get sucked out by the scavenge pump and fill up the oil tank, and it might overfill and spew inside the engine compartment it's going to make a big mess somebody's going to be unhappy so the best time to check engine oil level is right after you shut it down all the oil has been scavenged out of the engine and it should read exactly where it ought to so the best time to check oil for for accuracy is right after engine shutdown. So if you're coming out to the airplane a day or two later and you're checking the oil level, you're just looking to say, is there oil in it or is that there not? Because you're the one that checked the oil level last time, especially if you're flying a business jet. And if there's oil on the ground, then that probably means there's an oil leak and you're going to have to do something about it. Chip detector lights, we've talked about chip detector lights before. If the chip detector lights are on, then you're not going to go flying that day. You need to report it, and a mechanic needs to pull the chip detector out and see what kind of metal particles are down in the bottom of the oil reservoir, the re reduction gearbox for the prop or the shaft, or the accessory section. And, of course, while you're doing a pre-flight, you're going to be looking for fuel leaks and oil leaks on the bottom of the cowling or on the ground. And... Interestingly enough, in FAR Part 91, we'll get into it more on the chapter on airworthiness requirements. Uh, there's essentially three ways to take care of things that are wrong on the airplane. Under Part 91, there's uh, you can check to make sure it's not required by an airworthiness directive, by Part 91, by the approved flight manual, 
You got to determine if it's going to be hazardous for the flight. You got to mark it inoperative. You got to deactivate it or remove it. Or you can do what the minimum equipment list says. Or you can um, you can get a special flight permit. So essentially, there's three ways that you can take care of discrepancies. Either the seven steps in FAR 91. You can use the MEL if you have one approved, or if you're going to fly somewhere to get maintenance done, you can get a special flight permit. Typically, special flight permits are only authorized when the airplane's unairworthy to be able to fly somewhere to make it airworthy. That is, to take it somewhere where you're going to get maintenance done. Okay, you're pre-flight in the airplane. You're going to stick your head in the pre-flight and make sure there's no foreign objects in there because if you, there are, are foreign objects, they're going to get sucked up by the engine and damage the blades, and you'll have FOD, foreign object damage. Take a look at the intake walls if you can. If there's anything loose, you need to ride it up and have it fixed. Don't start the engine if there's anything loose inside of the intake. You're going to be looking at that... Uh, N1 compressor blade, the first compressor blade that is, that might be the fan, and see what it looks like, see if it's damaged. And if you have a turbojet or turbofan that has an engine pressure ratio gauge, there'll be one or more EPR probes in the intake, and you'll want to look for them. It's, it doesn't look like a pitot tube, but it is something sticking up with a hole in it, so you would, if you could see it from where you're at, You'd want to look and see if there's uh, anything clogged in that EPR probe. You go back around to the back of the engine, and again, you're going to be looking for foreign objects, although if they're there, they'll just get blown out the tailpipe. In this case, you're probably more interested in things that have come out of the engine or somebody did maintenance and left it in the, in the exhaust section. Again, just like you would in the intake, you're looking for the condition of the blades. Of course, in this case, they're the rotating turbine blades. Thermocouples, this is the same as uh, EGT if you'd remember if you prefer remembering the EGT probes and look for what condition they're in that would be good um, if you have again a turbojet or turbofan that's going to have uh, that uses an engine pressure ratio gauge there'll be EPR probes usually more than one in the tailpipe you'll check those for condition the exhaust pipe itself you can ch check to see if it has heat damage if it's warped and if you have an airplane with thrust reversal components, you ought to give them a grab and try to wiggle them. They ought to be secure and in place. You're getting ready to get the engine started. There's a few things you need to take into account. Some of it's a little bit similar. Some of it's not similar to a piston power job with a propeller. Jet blast effects. Not only is the velocity much, much, much higher and much greater in volume than a 172 propeller at idle, it's hot. It's hot, so if somebody's standing back there, not only will it knock them over, it'll burn them. And the distance that it'll go, since the velocity is much hot farther, if here's your business jet and you've got your engines on the back of the end of the airplane, the distance that this goes back is a lot farther than a propeller would blow air on a small piston-powered airplane. Of course, you want to take a look on the ground in front of the engines to make sure you're not going to suck up any foreign objects, maybe not suck up any people. Technically, if you suck up a ground person, uh, that's a foreign, that's foreign object damage. Um, me personally, if it's a corporate operation, I'm going to make sure that that ground power unit, if it's supplying electricity because I have a DC starter generator, or it's supplying pneumatic power if I have a pneumatic starter, I'm going to make sure that that connection is uh, is very is connected very well and not trust that low paid ground uh, gas pumper to make sure that it works and if it's a if it's a DC starter motor you ought to look on the side of that ground power unit and make sure that it has enough amps if uh, once you get that ground power unit running if it's supplying compressed air you're going to want to look on a gauge in the cockpit to make sure that the pounds per square inch is up to it. Typically it's about 60 PSI. If you're looking on that gauge you probably need at least 40 or higher otherwise you're not supposed to start the engine. So you're going to want to make sure that if you're using a ground power cart that's producing compressed air that you're receiving a high enough pressure to actually be safe to start the engine. Heat soaked is when you've shut the engine down and not very much later you go back to start the engine again and the engine is hot. If you look at the EGT gauge
and let's just say here's a red line, and let's say here's 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, if it's 15 degrees Celsius outside and the engine is heat soaked, this may be sitting here at 150 degrees Celsius. Well, if we try to start the engine at, uh, and it's already at 150 degrees Celsius inside the engine, when we start the engine, the EGT could easily go higher than redline because it's starting so much higher. So what you like, you may have to do if the engine is heat soaked, is motor the engine. Motoring the engine means the fuel is off, fuel nozzles are off, the ignition is off, and you're just spinning the engine around with, a, with the starter motor to get the compressor to spin. You want the compressor to blow cold air through the engine so the EGT will come down. And it might need to come down, say, to like 100 degrees Celsius before you're supposed to start the engine, and then it's okay. So this might be something that you would want to look in the uh, pilot operating handbook to find out if the engine is heat soaked. How do I, how far do I have to cool it down before I can do an engine start? Now here's some information that you might not have to memorize, but you want would want this very close by during an engine start. You'd probably want to write it in your checklist or put it on a 3x5 card and have that ready. So just in case you needed to know, you wouldn't have to spend 5 or 10 minutes looking it up in the approved flight manual. The duty cycles on the starter and on the ignition system. Uh, you probably don't have to have it memorized because under normal starts you're not going to exceed the starter duty cycle or the ignition duty cycle. But if the engine doesn't start up, the question is how long do I have to wait for the starter or the ignition to cool down and then how long can I run it and how many times can I do it. So this is good information to have readily available. Of course I already covered uh, that you would want to know what PSI do you have to have for start or uh, how many uh, amps you need to get out of a ground power unit. And I personally like this one. During engine start, here's fuel flow, and let's say here's zero. Um, although there's typically no red lines or green arcs or red arcs on the fuel flow gauge, PPH is pounds per hour, by the way, if just for fun, normally, it came up to 500 pounds per hour during engine start, I'd want to know that. If the engine was running at idle, if that's what it normally is during start, and it's to say that it typically runs 700 pounds at idle, then I'm going to know during engine start if I'm spinning that thing up and I hit 20% and I turn the ignition on and the fuel nozzles on and the RPM still keeps going up and I look down at the fuel flow gauge and it's sitting there at 500 pounds per hour then I'm going to be pretty happy. That's going to give me a warm fuzzy. But if during engine start it comes up here and it's pointing at a thousand pounds an hour and I haven't even gotten to idle yet then that's going to give me an indication that I might just have a hung st or correction have a hot start because the fuel control is squirting in twice as much fuel as normal but we're still getting the same amount of air so it's likely that the EGT is going to go higher so I'm going to want to keep an eye on the fuel flow during start and what it typically is during idle and I'm gonna write that down it might not be in the pilot operating handbook in fact it's typically not in the pilot operating handbook um, but I want to know in advance of a hot start so I'm gonna pay attention when I first start operating a jet engine I'm gonna be looking at fuel flow during start and what's normal fuel flow during idle and keep that in mind and I'm gonna be writing that down so if it's not what it normally is I'll be a lot more likely to be ready for that exhaust for that hot start and then I can do something about it right away. Now here's some things that you need to have memorized. Is it a good idea to have it on a 3x5 card or write it into the checklist? Absolutely, but these are things that you should know off the top of your head. Of course, the most important one is how hot can it get before I need to perform a hot start procedure and turn the fuel nozzles off and motor the engine if possible. You're not going to have time to look this up during engine start. You're going to have to know this off of the top of your head. Same thing for RPMs. When do I turn on the ignition and the fuel? Now typically that's at around 20 percent but it varies on every single engine. If you, you're the one doing this, you're going to have to turn the ignition on. You're going to have to turn the fuel nozzles on. So you're going to have to know when is that. Same thing for turning the starter switch off. Whoops. Same thing for turning the starter switch off. When do you let get a let go? 
Now typically our generic number is 40% with idle being at 50%, but every engine is different. But you're so you're going to need to know. If that starting sequence isn't done until the engine has reached idle, then certainly you need to know what is the appropriate idle RPM. Is it 50% plus or minus 2? Is it 48% plus or minus 1? You're going to need to know this off the top of your head. These days, uh, well, it doesn't matter what days it is. The computer, if you've got a full authority digital electronic control, a lot of the engine starting sequences are automatic. In fact, on the Boeing 777, you can pick to do a manual start or an automatic start. If you pick to do an automatic start, it does everything for you except it doesn't shut the engine down for low oil pressure. So in that case, you only have to do one thing. You, you uh, poop, turn the fuel nozzle switch on and you push the automatic start switch and then you don't have to do anything except for monitoring oil pressure. If you do manual, then you got to decide when to turn on the fuel and you're holding down the starter switch. You got to decide when to turn on the ignition and the fuel and you got to decide when to let go of it. So you need to know, you need to know off the top of your head during engine start, what am I going to do as a pilot and what is the computer or the fuel control going to do for me? And like I said in another slide, it's very common for the starter switch to be hooked up to the ignition so that when you turn the starter on, the ignition is on. So that would be something you would want to know. And of course, these last two items here, turning the fuel nozzle off and being able to crank up the starter, if you have a hot start or a hung start, you know, if you have a hot start or a hung start, fuel nozzles off and motor engine if possible. So you're going to need to know exactly where the switch is, where the lever is to turn off the fuel nozzles, and exactly how can I motor the engine, when can I do it based on what kind of starter it is. You need to have be very, very ready for that. Fortunately, transport category jets with the airlines, they're going to let you practice this in the simulator. If you have any questions about engine operation part one, you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on improving this lecture, please let me know as well. Thank you.